Okay, hello everyone, my name is John McDonald, and today we're back on Flourages with the answers to our request for your questions and answers, which was really exciting. So, this was something we've been wanting to do for ages, and I really want to say a huge thank you from Janus and I for the engagement that we get from people. We get really good comments and we get lots of feedback, and it's great to hear from you guys. And people send us pictures, uh, ask us questions, and we love that because it's great to know that you're enjoying the videos and maybe you learn something and we learn something from you guys as well. So if you've ever got any suggestions or anything, then just leave us a comment or get in touch. So let's crack on with the answers to the questions. Now we had a good response and what we've done is we've broken this down into different categories that are kind of similar. So we'll probably do two videos and this is the first video of the two. So the first question really was, um, I would love to hear how you started your career with flowers, and that's from Lynette Coleman. So, um, I grew up on a farm. I'm really a farmer, and uh, flowers were never something that I thought about doing. It literally started as a Saturday job. Uh, my mum was in town shopping. There was a sign in a window saying Saturday girl wanted. She went in and says, does it have to be a girl? And they said no and uh, I got a job there. So I started it with a Saturday job, ended up doing the cleaning and the cleaning buckets and running around. D essentially holiday cover for the first week, so I was painting windows. And um, it just went from there that the lady that I worked for, it turned out that she actually also did the flowers in a large five-star hotel in central Scotland. And um, she worked there and she had different people in the two shops that she had. And it ended up that I really worked in the hotel with her at the weekends and during holidays. Because when I first started work, I was 14. And I used to go at the weekends and really be like the gopher. So I would go and deliver things, go and get things, clean things. And then one day she went away early on the Sunday. People came around and said, oh, we need, really need flowers for one of the, the functions that was coming on, but to sit in the corner of the room. Now, we had an old one, but it wasn't looking so good. And I thought, well, do you know what? I've got time. I could try and make one because uh, I'd watched really what my boss was doing. And that was how it started. I made this arrangement and um, I ended up working for her for about two years. And then she, she lost the contract at the hotel and I managed to find out who was taking over the contract. I worked with that lady and then the next lady and then ultimately I went and did hotel management. So I never went to college to do floristry, I went and did uh, hotel and catering management. That was great because ultimately any management course is a good thing to have. It doesn't matter what examples they use. So in my situation it was hospitality examples, but you could just as equally apply a lot of what we learned to a floristry business. So I felt that was a really good help to me, even though at that time I didn't realise where I ultimately would be. So I finished my four years doing that and then came out, really needed a job, back into floristry, but I'd, I'd help people at Christmas and things over that time. And then after working in a local shop for two or three years, um, one of the very established shops in the town came up for sale. And uh, someone suggested to me, why don't you go and have a look at it? And I thought, well, it's really not for me. I wouldn't want to work in there. But it did put the idea in my head that, well, why couldn't I do something for myself? So I ended up having my own business, starting my own business, and ran that for 10 years uh, in the city of Dundee in Scotland. And then after that, the problem with the shop is it becomes a little bit like a Groundhog Day. Every day is the same. And... Uh, it can drive you a little bit mad and I wanted to do something different. So I ended up working for a business that sold floristry products and specifically artificial stems and Christmas products. So we used to go and do trade shows. Uh, we used to sell even to like film sets and film producers. They wanted big bulk hedging or stuff like that. We would, we would supply that. So I did that for a little while and then I actually went full circle went back to the hotel to help them with a, a big event and ended up working back there and ultimately took over from my, my boss and uh, headed up the department. Now, last year I decided to leave the hotel and now I live in Hungary, which is a bit of a, a curveball, but 
beautiful place, beautiful country, and just wanted a change of scene and to do something different. And to take the focus off having to really do a nine to five, Monday to Friday, 40, 50 hour a week, and just be able to pick and choose what I like to do. And obviously concentrate on Flourish's videos. So that's really my background. Never planned to be a florist, but I thoroughly love working with my hands and being creative. And floristry became an outlet for that and allowed me to have a whole career where I really, it hasn't felt like work at all, which don't tell anyone, but it's been, it's been a joy to do. So that's the background. So I hope that answers your question, Lynette. Uh, and then into flowers. So just talking about flowers in general. So someone asked, um, could I give any tips on conditioning hydrangeas because they wilt so quickly? Can uh, we show you the best way to arrange them? Well, with arranging them, we'll look at that maybe in future videos. But for conditioning hydrangeas, they really are a nightmare. And we've actually been asked this for hydrangeas from Summer Wind, lilacs from JP, and poppies from Trudy. So let's talk about the hydrangeas and the lilacs because they're kind of similar. They're both a problem flower. They're absolutely beautiful, they're quite expensive, uh, you get them in and they have a tendency to wilt. So what we tended to do was, knowing that the flowers are coming in, we would have short buckets with tepid water, as soon as the hydrangeas come in, cut a good couple of inches up with a knife on a slant, so a sharp knife, straight into water. If it was very warm, then what I would do is I would mist the hydrangea as well. Not spray them so that they're wet, just give them a mist so that there's a moisture there and they're not drying out. Uh, and that helps preserve the hydration that's in them. And if it's really warm and you're really worried about it or you're wanting them to really not lose any moisture at all, you could lay a very light um, cellophane, no, maybe not cellophane, but like a plastic membrane. So like a, a big plastic bag that you've opened up, like a rubbish bag, that very thin, light plastic, just lay that over the top of them. That helps keep the moisture on them, makes them much less likely to wilt. But I would say with hydrangea and lilac, they're better in water, they don't particularly like foam, but if you were doing a wedding and you're wanting to use either of these in foam, I would make up the items as far as possible without putting them in, and then put them in on the day. Or if you can make the things on the day, that's even better, but it depends on the, the logistics of that. So they're really something that want to be brought in at the last minute, given a good condition for 24 hours, recut and ideally used in water rather than foam. And if they do well, you need to check them over uh, the day of use. If they're looking dodgy in any way, have some backup ones that you can swap over. So tricky, but the poppies, we haven't really had poppies a lot, and um, my understanding with poppies is that you can singe or sear the stems with a candle. Um, another thing is you can put them into boiling water. Essentially, it's got like a, a latexy sort of sap. So what you want to do is you want to stop it bleeding. So boiling water or a candle. Commercially, that becomes a bit of a problem. It's much harder to do anything like that in volume. But for home use, then definitely I would give them a go. For all of these, you're wanting not freezing cold water, you want tepid water, and just to make sure that they've got good, clean water, more than necessarily flower food. But generally for flowers, flower food, definitely use flower food. So, another question from Enchanted Fleurs. Please share your flower care when you receive them. Any tricks and methods to keep your flowers fresh and stay alive longer? Well, when I had my shop, what, I used, what we used to do was we signed up for the Chrysal, um, you know, the big drums of fruit, food. So you can actually have that that goes straight into your water. So you can get like Chrysal 1, Chrysal 2, or Chrysal 2, Chrysal 3. There are four different levels. So there'll be a treatment that's done maybe at the grower. Then there's a treatment that's specifically for shop. And then the final treatment for customers is more sugars to keep things going, whereas the shop one is more for stopping bacteria, but giving them a little bit of sugar to help them start to develop. So we did use that system, and what we found was that we would clean all our buckets, fill them with the flower food water, and that really made a difference for the, the flowers lasting in the shop. 
Um, it was expensive, I would say, but it, it did work very well. Uh, are there edible flowers? If so, which ones? Well, there's lots of edible flowers, uh, violas, pansies, roses. Most of these can be used. I would check, uh, like marigolds, not a problem. What you want to do is you want to double check before using them. But the majority of them are okay. The one thing that you might want to ask is if you're going to use flowers that are commercially grown, they're going to maybe have insecticide or something on them. So you might want to use garden grown where you know that they're not covered in chemicals. Um, I mean, it's such a small amount, it's probably never going to kill anyone. But just keep that in mind um, that you don't know where those flowers have been. So um, it might be worth sourcing them from a, a proven supplier that deals with edible flowers. Okay, I'm doing my son's wedding and I grow Austin, David Austin roses. I like to keep, uh, I would like to help keep them good. And how do I get shop bought peonies to open when I need them? So basically, Sharon, you're going to, you've got a good supply of roses and you want to use your garden roses with shop bought, shop bought peonies to create your son's wedding. Again, it's the same treatment that you would do for the hydrangeas and the lilacs. They want to have a good cut, clean cut on a slant into tepid water and a good overnight at least condition. You don't want any damaged leaves or anything in the water that's going to turn the water. So a really good drink before you start using them. With the peonies for actually getting them to open, that's a tricky one. And I used to, to be honest, curse brides who wanted to have peonies. But years ago it was very hard to know how to get them. Now, because they're really popular, they seem to be much more reliable as a flower and they'll open. What you want is really peonies that are showing a bit of colour. But for a wedding, I would always order extra. Or maybe even split my order so if we were getting a, a wedding on Saturday, I would bring flowers in on maybe the Sunday and then the Wednesday and then pick from those. But obviously if you're just doing a wedding and you have no other work that you're doing flowers for, then you really want to use all the flowers that you bought. If you're a shop where you can use flowers in other orders, so if they open too quickly or they open too slowly, it just rolls into other parts of a week, then that's a better situation. And um, Robin Todhunter asked, are there home garden flowers that are good for arranging? Um, basically, they want to grow them so that they can be cut. And yes, there's absolutely loads. So things like Achenille Mollus, fantastic filler. Solidago, again, a filler. September flower or asters, sweet peas. There's lots of things that you can get. Uh, that you could grow yourself. And what I would be more inclined to do is look at things that are easy to look after and grow a good volume rather than things that are necessarily difficult. So there's no point in killing yourself trying to grow orchids if they're not going to grow in your garden. Try and grow the things that make sense. So roses are really very cheap to buy in some ways. Unless you're wanting a very special type of rose, I would go for the fillers and the foliages. So even a eucalyptus tree, keep cutting it down so you're always getting an abundance of that fresh new growth. And that's a, that's a really good thing to have. We have had a couple of questions lately where people have said, what do you do with garden material where there might be insects? Well, you want to have a visual inspection as you cut it. You want to give it a slight shake. And then what I would do is I would condition it overnight, but have it conditioning in an outside an outside shed or the garage. So if there are insects on it, they've got the opportunity to leave or to go elsewhere, even leave the bucket outside. Okay, what is Salal? Uh, Dave Gardner has asked. Now, Salal is very much a popular foliage that you get florists using. It's got a typical leaf shape, but in a bright kind of green, it's on a woody stem, and it's basically a plant called Goltheria. I'm not sure if I uh, pronounced that correctly, but you get different varieties that you can have for the garden, uh, from small ones that are better for berries to the ones that are bigger and bushier and more for foliage. So it is something that you'll be able to grow in a climate, climate such as Britain, no problem at all. You will see them growing in borders and uh, round hedges. And it is just like a low bush, so very easy to grow and a very useful one. 
Now, someone asked me how best to use callas in a casket spray. And um, I think we've touched on this in one or two of the videos that we've done in the past, so you might want to have a little look. If I was making a big casket spray and I'm using a material that is difficult to use because it has a soft squidgy stem, then what I would do is I would place them first. Now if the stems seem very delicate, I would be inclined to use a piece of pencil or another stem, make a guide hole and then put that flower in. Now I know some people think that's not great. You don't want to make a guide hole that's too big. You want it to be snug on the stem. So you want to pick a stem that's similar to your calla stems. Make your guide hole, push your calla in, and then create your spray from that. If you try and add callas once you've put in foliage and other flowers, it becomes very, very difficult. And um, actually you asked if, if it was good to wire them. Personally, I would avoid that. The less that you can damage the stem or the flower, the less likely they are to suddenly turn and go off. You just want to do a clean cut into foam and leave it at that. You really don't want to mess around. If you are feeling that they need more support, then you could cut them and give them a drink to try and make them a bit stronger. If they are still floppy, then you can actually use some foliage underneath to help give support. So the actual framework created by the other flowers will support your callas as well. Okay, so where do I buy materials from? Well, really we would go to a wholesaler. So if you're not a business, uh, then that becomes harder. Uh, if you're not a business, then the supermarkets are actually a great source of flowers. They've really diversified their ranges. You can buy just Iris or Just Gypsophila, places like Morrison's in the UK are now offering foliage and interesting things for people that they know are going to work them into something rather than it's a bokeh and it's for a gift. So wholesale is where we would buy the bulk. Um, if you're not in that position, then I would suggest supermarkets. But have a look online. Some suppliers do online as well. Now, going into floristry then, so that was really just looking at flowers in general. Someone asked a simple way to construct a long table runner for a, flower, uh, a friend's wedding, and that was from Sally Harkis. To be honest, the easiest way to make it is if you can do it in foam. So if you have like long double trays or triple trays, even if you want to take your foam and cut it in half so that you literally, you're not taking up the whole tree with a big block, you're literally taking up the middle half of the tree with half a block. Straight away you can make your runner neater if you're a bit tight on space and you're also saving on foam. Um, and that leads on to a question which is people are not so keen on foam, uh, is there other things that they could use? Well, say you were wanting to make a table runner uh, without foam, what you could do is you could actually do scrunched up decor wire, like the thicker wire, and put tubes in and then put your flowers in. Or you can even, if you're able to decorate the table quite close to the time of the actual function, you could just lie like Italian or French ruscus down the table and just put your flower heads on loose. Or they could be tubed, uh, depends on your type of flower. So the closer to a function, the more you'll get away with, and the further, in the, the further that you want to pre-prepare, then you need to really nail down that everything's going to be good. The great thing about using the floral foam in the trays with something like this, you can pre-make it and then it's just a case of easily lifting it and placing it. And that really, that can be a point to keep in mind. Whereas if you're going to actually lay out material and put things in, that's a lot more labour intensive and also you're on a time constraint. Because if you turn up at a venue at 10 in the morning to do that and they don't set the table till 1 in the afternoon, you, you're, really, you're really stuck. So there are options and uh, hopefully we'll explore some of these in some future videos as well. Now, Mike Bruno, you asked me what my style is and um, I would say my style is probably definitely biased towards plant material and flower material so I like it to have a majority of natural material and I like foliages, I think that gives things a real balance. In the wild you don't tend to get 
just flowers. So personally, I probably like to do a mix of different foliages with flowers, uh, and that foliage really gives things a background. So really my style would probably be like a garden style or a naturalistic style would probably be my best way to describe it. Now, what materials did I find difficult to work with when I first started out and that I really love now? Well, when I first started out working with flowers and I worked in a hotel, we used to have to make loads of little posies and loads of, a lot of volume of things. And the things that I really hated was corsage work and things using spring flowers like daffodils or hyacinths. Corsage work is really tricky when you first do it and uh, you're going to find that you either love it or you hate it but what you'll find is that once you learn the techniques and how to put things together then it doesn't really matter as long as you're consistent with the process then the result will be good I think initially sometimes you get a bad result you don't understand why and it puts you off but if you understand the process of constructing something then that will give you a consistency in the end result which will give you much more confidence. So now I quite like spring flowers mm, but daffodils and hyacinths I'd probably still put them in a vase and just have them as they are. If a client's budget, now this is a terrible question uh, Bella Biodori, uh, if a client's budget would only permit the use of one type of greenery what would you select and why? That's a rotten question because there's so many different greeneries and why would you just use one? So I thought I had the answer and I thought I was going to say like Italian Ruscus. It's really versatile because it's long, you can cut it short, you could make a pedestal with it, you could chop it down for long table arrangements, you could chop it, you could use it for garlands. It really is a wonderful material because it's also got a kind of thickness in the leaf. It doesn't wilt, you can make things in advance. So I would probably say Italian Ruscus or French Ruscus, love it. Uh, but as I was thinking that, I actually thought eucalyptus, because with eucalyptus you have about five or six at least different versions, some with beautiful berries and seed pods, so eucalyptus. But if pushed, I would rather have more than one type, thank you very much. So, someone also asked, pin holder, what's the best size? Now you can get lots of different types of pin holder. You can get rectangular ones, you can get round ones. If you're going to buy one, I would kind of ask myself, what are you wanting to do with that one pin holder? If you buy a really big one, you, you're going to find that's quite hard to hide. If you buy a really, really small one, it's going to limit you in the size of arrangement you can make. I would think for most people doing kind of medium-sized arrangements in their own home, I would go for one that's maybe seven to nine centimetres across and I would go for a round pin holder. That would be the one that I would have and I would also look to buy one that is Japanese. So it definitely has the copper pins, not steel pins or different metal because they will last you a lifetime. Okay, floristry still. So, Jake said that they're going to be making uh, flowers, like a garland, a full garland, very floral, on a foam base to go 40 foot on a staircase. Uh, now that is some job. And someone else actually also asked about how to secure large, large scale installations. So I suppose this kind of falls into it. With things like garlands, then cable ties, cable ties, strong string, Baylor twine, anything really strong, or even wire, garden wire. With things that are out with the norm, your one main thing to think about is safety and security. So if you're going to attach things to a balcony, a strong thin wire is better than a big thick ribbon that you can't hide. Um, if you're going to hang things, you want to make sure that the cable, uh, the chain, has the strength to take the weight. So sometimes with things like this, you need to do a trial run. If you're wanting to make something in a very specific area, then you need to know someone who can craft a mechanic that will help. So a good relationship with someone who is a metal worker or a blacksmith really does pay dividends. So like people who want an arch at a church, the doorway to churches can be massive. 
So you need to find someone who can construct a frame that is modular, can be put together very simply in place, and this is something that people can't just walk in the door and ask. They're going to have asked about this months in advance, and you have time to actually do it. But I would say if you're going to order something like that from another supplier, do not tell them when you want it. If you want it in May, say that you need it for April, because if they have any delay, you need to build in a little bit of um, grace so that you're covered. So, yes. Um, not a fan of floral foam alternatives. The best alternative is probably chicken wire. There's things like the floral guppy, um, frogs, all these things create a structure that you can fit flowers in. I think you really need to ask yourself what's your purpose. If you're going to be doing event work and the containers and everything come back to you, then great. If you're going to be doing event work, then my question would be, would the customer not expect to keep those flowers? So if they're going to keep the arrangement and then give it away to uh, one of their guests, then you can't get your mechanics back. So simple things like chicken wire or selling items that are hand tied um, so that they're actually, the construction method is actually in the flowers itself or flowers just loosely in a vase, that type of thing. So something to keep in mind. But really for doing big specific things, you need to work out a proper plan for the structure underneath. And you definitely don't want people being killed by something big and heavy falling over. For people who are just doing flowers for their own enjoyment, there's lots of options instead of foam. You can use gravel, stones, pin holders, uh, other twigs, um, test tubes, natural plant stems that become tubes, scrunched up wire, like decor wire, chicken wire, there's loads. And actually it's really good fun exploring those. Now, Laura, Laura, Laura Minard asked, I'm interested in starting flower arranging. What equipment would I need or recommend that I invest as a beginner? The two things I would suggest is a good pair of scissors, and a pair of secateurs. And if you're going to be doing a lot of flowers or a lot of volume of flowers, then it is worth actually learning how to use just a very simple florist knife. That is really, really good, more than scissors. So a knife and secateurs or scissors and secateurs, and that's really all you need just to get started. And then really the world's your oyster and you can just add things from there. A living a vase flower arrangement, they leak. I would like to make for my friend's birthdays, but they're without ruining their furniture. So a living vase, essentially hand tie bokeh, but in, wrapped in such a way that it holds water. If you're really not sure that you're going to achieve it, then I would suggest that you source a vase that you can create your flowers in and then wrap that vase. And then you know that the water is within a vase. The only problem with a glass vase is that there is a danger of it being broken. But if you're going to give it as a gift, then you can put it into a gift bag with some tissue to protect that. So if you're not sure about wrap holding water, then I would look for a container that gives you the same shaped arrangement but holds water. And there's a good range of vases in that available now. So even in some of the kind of home decor shops, that's really good. How do you go about colour choices? Well, if you're in floristry, I would say a lot of the colour choices are dictated to you by the occasion, what it's for. That will probably point you in a direction straight away. The customer's choice, like they may, might say, oh, their favourite's pink. Um, the season, so at certain times of the year, everyone's going to want red and white, and the rest of the year they don't. Um, and then it also comes down to what you have available. So if you're in a shop situation and you have predominantly borrowed, uh, ordered and brought in whites and creams and yellows, then if the order is not specific, you use what you have most of. And that leaves you with the best range for a future customer. If you constantly go... <coughs> if you constantly go... Uh, in one direction, then essentially you're going to run out of something just because you enjoyed using it, and that's not so good. So, but when it comes to colour choices, um, 
I have to confess, I'm actually red being colourblind. So that gives me a slight problem in shades. So things like a dark purple with a dark royal blue or a navy blue, I find very hard to differentiate. Or red and green from a distance becomes hard to differentiate. I quite like going for bold colour choices. So oranges and purples put together, red and purple put together. I think that works very well in certain circumstances. Uh, circumstances but actually it's really nice to connect with pastel colours in a range uh, and that works well as well but I think it's equally possible that you could take one type of flower like a gerbera and have lots of different colours and the unifying factor then becomes the flower they're all the same flower so it doesn't matter that one's red and one's pink and one's yellow and one's orange you actually if you're going to do that Really go for it and just have all the colours, but make sure that they're quite strong colours and then it looks really zingy. Um, now, someone asked, do you think there's a difference between America and UK in their approach to floral design? Uh, this is from someone called Art. I think America's much more business-like. I think America... Um, has different challenges as well compared to the UK. The UK is quite a temperate climate, so we don't need to worry about extremes in temperature. The other thing that we have is we seem to have a lot more space. In America, there's a lot more space, but when I went to, say, New York, for example, a lot of the arrangements seem to be very compact and very neat. But this probably translates into you can get more of them into your vehicle for delivery, uh, and it's, a, it's an easy style for the customer to look after. In the UK, we quite like that kind of full foliage, wild uh, kind of garden style, and that really comes from our history and our gardening background. So I think there is a difference. I don't think it's huge. There's one or two things that are specifically American, and um, you might find differences in things like, say, funeral work. Like in the UK, we don't tend to put things on a stand, whereas in America, you probably put them on like a tripod stand. And we can, we can actually take inspiration from each other, which I think is really good. And the final question on this thing, and for this section, was do we use a flower cooler? Well, in the UK, we never use a flower cooler, but I would say it depends on your situation. If you're in Scotland, where it's generally cooler, then you probably don't need one. If you're on the south coast of England, then you possibly do. But if you were looking to have a shop and have your flowers in a shop. If you pick a shop that faces the north, uh, so it's on the south side of the street but it faces north, that shop will be cooler. If you pick a shop on the other side of the street that gets the sun coming in the window, that's going to take the temperature up and it's going to be harder to keep fresh flowers. So there is places for coolers and there's times when you don't need them. And I would say you just need to be aware of which place you're in. So we're going to stop this video here now because it's been quite long and our second video is going to look at pricing and also just some aspects of business and yeah, some more exciting things that you've all asked us. So thank you very much for watching this video and we look forward to coming back and sharing some more answers to your questions.